Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Corps. This is the Larkbox X. It's the latest mini PC from Chewy, and we're gonna take a look at it today. Now, this little guy comes with a Ryzen 7 CPU and what I would call a moderately budget price. It's at $400 altogether. And for that price, we're gonna get a PC that can function as an everyday PC and does a pretty good job with gaming too. And one of the things I appreciate about this device is its sleek design. It is a nice and clean looking PC. And so in today's video, we're going to take a look at its performance and see whether or not it's worth $400. And so without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, let's start with the specs. This runs a Ryzen 7 3700U CPU, which has four cores and eight threads and a base clock of 2.3 gigahertz. And it does have a turbo clock up to four. In terms of internal graphics, this has a Vega 10 GPU. So not the most modern thing in the world, but fairly decent. In terms of RAM and storage, there is only one option available, eight gigs of DDR4 RAM and 256 gigs of NVMe internal storage. And they did a pretty good job with connectivity here. It has Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, and two different gigabit ethernet ports. As far as display out capability, it has DisplayPort HDMI 2.0, as well as a fully functioning USB-C port. And it ships with Windows 10 Home, but it can also run Linux as well. We'll show that off later in this video. They did a pretty good job with the packaging here. The user manual doesn't have a lot of good information, mostly just the labeling of the parts. Here's a look at the power brick here. I like that it's not just one big plug, but all the same, the entire power supply is relatively large. And so first impressions here, it does feel very nice and lightweight. In terms of general mini PCs that I've reviewed recently, this one's pretty small. The entire shell is plastic, so no fancy metal parts here. And I like the circular intake vent here at the top, but it is a little bit weird that the fan itself does not line up to that circle. And so depending on what angle you're looking at at the top here, it can be a little bit odd. Not a lot going on at the bottom here, just a clip for the visa mount. And I like the fact that you don't have to remove the rubber feet in order to get to the screws. On the front, it's nice and clean. We have two USB 3.0 ports, USB-C, headphone jack, and the power button. There's also a CMOS reset button if you need it. And on the back here, we have the power plug, dual gigabit ethernet ports, display port and HDMI 2.0, and then two more USB 3.0. We also have the exhaust vent here in the back. Yeah, overall, I'd say the design is pretty clean. And it's pretty lightweight. We're looking at under 400 grams. And it's relatively small too, as you can see here, compared with Kerrygold Butter. It's about maybe two and a quarter butters altogether, not too big. Here's a comparison against an Xbox controller, so quite a bit smaller. Overall, I like the design and I do think that it would fit really well on somebody's desktop. My only design complaint is the fan isn't lined up here on the top. So let's open it up and see what we have going on inside. I did find the best way to open this up is to just use a little bit of leverage with that clip here in the center. And so here's how it looks. Initially, I thought there was space for a SATA hard drive, especially with that little arrow there. I thought maybe that was a way to plug it in, but no, that's just how to align up the clips when you put the device back together. We've got two four gigabyte sticks here of DDR4 RAM running at 2666. And the device supports up to 32 gigs of RAM, so this is easy to replace. So now let's take a look at the NVMe card. Thankfully, this one is a known and reputable brand, but only 256 gigs. It's really a shame here that they didn't add SATA mounts for an additional drive. It does look like there are plugs here, and one of these might actually work for a SATA hard drive, but there's no hardware here to actually allow you to plug this thing in. In fact, the only other thing they package in this device is the Visa mount. There's nothing here for any hard drive mount either. And same thing with the manual here. There's no mention of adding an additional hard drive. It's really a shame. And so yeah, I think that's a pretty big letdown. They should have had an additional SATA hard drive mount here because now you're gonna be stuck with the internal storage or an external hard drive. So let's boot the device up and actually see how it performs. I've already gone ahead and set everything up and installed everything here, but let me give you a look at the internal properties. As you can see, it does run that Ryzen 7 3700U with eight gigs of RAM and running Windows 10 Home. Let's dive a little bit more into the Ryzen 7 CPU here. So here are the specs here. This is a bit of an older chip. It came out about three years ago and it's primarily made for laptops. Biggest thing here is that the TDP is configurable up to 35 watts. So we might be able to give it some extra juice. And as you can see, it is capable of both Windows as well as Linux operating systems. So let's check the TDP that ships with the device. I'm gonna run a torture test here. And after a couple of minutes, you can see it gets up to about 62 degrees and it's pulling around 25 watts altogether. 
Now, going into the BIOS here, I did not find any way to configure the TDP. There's no power settings available. And so unfortunately, there's not a way to save it across the entire system. Luckily, there's other ways to change TDP. We're gonna use this one here, AMD APU Tuning Utility. And this is a free resource that has the ability to add custom profiles to your TDP. I've used it with the Aya Neo Next previously. So you can just go into the software here and then select pre-made presets and then drill down to find your APU. And so as you can see here, there already is a preset to set it to 35 watts. So I'm gonna apply those settings and then close it down and then run the torture test again. As you can see here, it's running at a stable 35 watts and the temperature bumped up to 76 degrees, but that's still relatively good. I would say for this price, the thermals on this are excellent. Now here's what it looks like on the desk here. I have an external hard drive hooked up with all of my games and Steam library and things like that. But overall it looks pretty good and the fan is relatively quiet. Here's what it sounds like when it kicks into its highest speed. So yeah, in terms of just overall fan design and noise, this is actually very good. And I think the computer itself looks nice and clean sitting on a desk like this. So let's do a couple other tests just when it comes to everyday use. We'll start with some video playback. Even though I like to test everything at 1080p, I'm gonna set this to 4K instead, and this runs with 4K 60 hz with all three display outputs. I'll also turn off the scaling to make sure we get true 4K when it comes to video playback. And so here we go, we're running a 4K movie, and as you can see, it dropped a few frames in the beginning, but then it stabilizes after a couple seconds. It dropped about 30 frames, and then it stayed very stable. So what that means to me is that this is gonna be really good for 4K video playback, but I also think thanks to that quad-core CPU, this is gonna function really well as a media server too. So if you wanted to run Plex or something like that on this, I think it'll be great. Okay, one last test here. I'm gonna run the core temp here at the bottom just to be able to check the power management as well as the CPU use. And I'm going to open up Google Chrome, and then I'm going to open up just 12 random tabs. And so we do get a spike when it comes to the CPU load initially, as well as the power consumption. But it loaded up these 12 tabs relatively easily. And so I think when it comes to just everyday browsing and computing, I think that this device will be fairly good. If you want even snappier performance, I would recommend swapping out that 8 gigs of RAM for something a little bit higher. At least 16, and maybe think about getting faster speed RAM as well. Either way, for everyday use, I'm confident that this is a pretty good PC. But this is a gaming channel, so let's check out gaming now. I've already installed Steam in a bunch of games, as well as a bunch of standalone emulators, so let's check those out next. So as always, I'm going to run everything in 1080p, and I will bump up the graphics as much as possible while maintaining a stable 60 frames per second. And it does a relatively good job with a lot of these lower end games. Things like Celeste or Horizon Chase, they're no problem. In fact, you can see with Horizon Chase, it gets easily over 200 frames per second, which is obviously overkill for this device, but all the same, it is a good indication there's a lot of headroom here. So let's kick it up a notch with some more graphically intensive games, things like Hades and Hollow Knight. These also can run at 1080p with 60 hertz no problem. In fact, they're only using about 50 to 60% of the GPU load, which is a nice sign that you're not gonna have any issues when it comes to playing these games. Now, in terms of Ori and the Will of the Wisps, this one I had to turn down to balance settings to get a good frame rate. And while it doesn't hit a stable 60 frames per second, it does stay above 50 and it gives you a relatively smooth experience. I'd be comfortable playing through this whole game at these settings and it looks really nice. If you're into competitive first-person shooters, this thing just barely manages over 60 frames per second with Counter-Strike Go at low settings. And so I think if you're going to play something like this or Valorant or any of those other ones, this is probably not going to be a great fit. You could get by, but it may not be a great experience. And then moving over to the more graphically intensive games like Street Fighter V, this one does not play at medium settings 60 frames. But if you turn it down to low settings, you will get a stable frame rate. Unfortunately, it just doesn't look very nice with low settings. And so you have some options here. You could maybe put it to 720p and then medium settings, but I'm not sure if that's going to give you the same kind of graphical fidelity as 1080p. And so finally, let's test Halo 4. Now this one is running at performance settings 1080p, and the frame rate is running between 40 and 60 frames per second. So it's not like the most ultra smooth experience, but at $400, this is the best performance I've seen for Halo 4. Typically, you would see something at the $500 range to get this running even better. So yeah, I think when it comes to light PC gaming, this will work fairly well. If you have a Steam catalog that has a lot of 2D games, you'll probably have a lot of fun here. 
But now let's move over to emulation. I'm gonna use some standalone emulators first. Here is PSP and I've upscaled this to a 4X resolution, which is 1080p. And as you can see, it's running at a very stable 60 frames per second here. This is actually running really well. And so across the board, I think when it comes to PSP gameplay, you can just set this to 4X resolution and then forget all about it. And even God of War Chains of Olympus, which is notoriously hard to emulate, it's running at stable 60 frames per second. You get a dip at 59 every once in a while, but it is completely unnoticeable. So overall, when it comes to PSP, this is working great. Let's kick it up a notch and really test the system. Here we're running 1080p GameCube, and for the most part, it works really well. Games like Mario Kart Double Dash, as well as Chibi Robo, they are running at a full frame rate. Now, Call of Duty 2 Big Red 1, it has a 30 frames per second cap, and I often would notice that it would dip under 30 frames per second, but I don't think that was because of the emulator. I think the game itself just is programmed to do that. Either way, the gameplay was smooth, and I would say this is perfectly playable. The only game that did give me some issues was F-Zero GX, which is always very hard to emulate. And the frame rate here was kind of all over the place. It would dip between 50 and 60 frames across the entire game, which would result in some tangible slowdown as well as some audio crackling. So not perfect GameCube on the PC side, but it is pretty close. I also tested it with Metroid Prime running the Prime hack, which allows you to use a mouse and keyboard or a controller for dual analog. And as you can see, it's running really well even at 1080p. It is nice and crisp. So let's move it up one other notch. Let's go to Nintendo Wii next. Now, Donkey Kong Country is kind of on that medium tier of emulation difficulty, but as you can see here, it is running at 1080p upscaled and no problem here. And it's a similar story with Tatsunoko vs. Capcom. It will dip down to something like 55 frames per second when you do some of those big special moves. But otherwise, when it just comes to like the regular fighting, it is running at a stable 60 frames. But it's not perfect. There are some games that are going to have issues. For example, Skyward Sword was not able to hit a stable 30 frames per second. So it does run slowly and it did have some audio issues too. We're going to try two different versions of PS2 emulation here. This is the stable version of PCSX2, and this is the one I normally test. And as you can see, it's running black at a stable 60 frames per second. And this is at a 720p resolution. However, when you try something like God of War, as you can see, it hovers around 50 frames per second and runs slow. So instead, let's try the nightly builds of PCSX2 here, which recently added Vulcan support. And so here we're running God of War again, this time with the Vulcan backend, and unfortunately the performance is worse than it was on the stable version. As you can see, I'm getting about 25 frames per second, and there are some graphical anomalies like the lines across the front. However, a lot of the other ones work really well, especially with this new nightly version with the Vulcan backend. As you can see, Grand Theft Auto 3 is running at a stable 60 frames per second. This looks really nice. And so I think when it comes to some of those less intensive games, things like role-playing games, Dark Cloud 2, they're all going to run at 60 frames no problem, even upscaled to a 2x resolution of 720p. In fact, even some of your favorite sports games, here is NBA 2K6, this one's also running at a stable frame rate too. So I do think that PS2 emulation is pretty good on this device, just not every single game. I would say based on my testing that maybe 90% of PS2 games will run at 720p. So let's kick it up one more generation to the Wii U. Now this is set to a 720p resolution, and while it's not getting 60 frames per second, it is staying above 50 frames with Mario Kart 8. I would say at this speed, it's completely playable. In the more lightweight games, things like Mario Tennis Ultra Smash, this is going to actually run at a stable 60 frames per second. Same thing with New Super Mario Bros. U. I was actually surprised at the performance across the board, considering the fact that the original Nintendo Wii was having some problems with emulation. Even Super Mario 3D World, which I would consider to be at that kind of upper tier when it comes to emulation, had no problem. And I forgot to press full screen at this point, so that's why it's a little bit smaller, but either way it runs just fine. And even when running Wind Waker at its native 1080p resolution, this actually ran really well too. So overall, I would say that this device is perfectly capable of playing Wii games. You may not be able to upscale things to 1080p with every single game, and of course Breath of the Wild is in its own category when it comes to emulation, but even this one will still run at a pretty good frame rate at 720p. It struggles to stay at 30 frames, but it does get around 25 altogether. And I was surprised to find that this actually doesn't result in any slowdown or audio issues when you're playing the game. It's not quite as smooth as I would like it to be, but all the same I would say this is playable as well. So overall, yeah, Wii U is great on this device. Now the last PC emulation I want to try is Nintendo Switch. When it comes to emulating 2D games, things like Metroid Dread, it's pretty good. I'm seeing a consistent frame rate between 55 and 60, which is 100% playable with this game. 
Now, unfortunately, with 3D games, things like Super Mario Odyssey, we are struggling to get even 30 frames per second. And so because of that, the slowdown in this, I would say, is unplayable. So really, I'm just comfortable in saying that this can emulate up to Wii U, no problem. Nintendo Switch is a different story. So now let's try running this with Linux. I'm going to use the Bodicera flash drive that I like to use with all these PC builds. And so I'm going to jump into the BIOS here and then set the priority boot order to have the USB drive first. That means when I have the USB drive in, it's going to boot Bodicera, and then when I take it out, it'll boot Windows. And so here is my typical Bodicera interface, which will allow me to scroll through my games and then test out whatever I want. Now, I recently upgraded this flash drive to Bodicera 33, which is super easy. All you have to do is just update it through the network. And there's quite a lot of good changes here. One of the things I really appreciate now is that they have these darker bezels available for some of these retro games. And so in addition to having these nice decorations which take up that extra portion of the screen, the fact that they are darker now just makes it a lot more pleasant on the eyes. It makes the game pop out a little bit more than the bezels. And of course, when it comes to retro emulation, we have no problems here. Everything is running just fine. And so if you wanted to set this up as a dual boot option to have that flash drive available when you want to have some retro gaming goodness, but then also primarily use this device as a Windows machine, this is going to work out really well. Moving on to some of the higher grade systems, as you can see, Nintendo 64, even upscaled to 1080p, has absolutely zero problem. It's running at a stable 60 frames per second. And then kicking it up another notch, we're going to do 1080p with PSP. And as you can see, this is also running just fine, too. And same thing with Sega Dreamcast, I've upscaled this to 1080p using the RetroArch Core, and I've also enabled widescreen cheats. And so yeah, I think when it comes to these systems, even upscaling to 1080p, they're all running buttery smooth. And surprisingly, when it comes to GameCube, this is actually running better than it did on the PC side. As you can see here, I'm running F-Zero GX, and it is at 60 frames completely stable. This is something I was not able to achieve on the Windows side at all. And so if you're a big fan of GameCube and you want to stay within that Bodicera environment, I think that you're going to have a good time here. Now moving it up to Wii U, unfortunately the performance on this one is not as good. And it's hard to say specifically why it is better on some systems than the other, but my suspicion here is because of the TDP. Because I wasn't able to change the TDP in the BIOS, I don't think I'm getting 35 watts here. I think because I had to use that Windows-based tuning utility, it's not actually carrying over to the Windows side. So this must be running at 25 watts instead of 35. And that's kind of unfortunate because I think if they had the 35 watts unlocked here, we would probably get some really nice performance on the higher end systems like Wii U and PS2. Because unfortunately, even running at the same specs that I was doing on the Windows side, the Bodicera side on this is lagging behind quite significantly. Even something like Grand Theft Auto 3, which was completely stable at 60 frames per second on the Windows side, is dipping below 50 frames per second in certain areas with this particular game. And so unfortunately, I would say that PS2 and Wii U are a little bit too much for the Bodicera side of this PC. But thankfully, these two systems do run well on the Windows side, which means that you do have an option to play them. It's just unfortunately not within the Bodicera environment. And finally, before we start wrapping up, here is the original Xbox emulation here. It's running at a 1x resolution with Halo, and it looks just fine, getting a stable 60 frames. And it's possible to run other games at a 2x resolution, for example, Dead or Alive 3. And 2x resolution of Xbox just looks beautiful. Unfortunately, not every game will play this way, but at least this one does, and it looks great. Okay, so now let's talk about what I like and what I don't like about this device. Number one, the thing I like the most about it is the design. Admittedly, many of the Chinese-based mini PCs are not very nice to look at. They just look kind of cheap and are very apparently from China. I think this one with the black and white color scheme does have a nice design that's a little bit better than the others. And as we saw with the performance testing, this is pretty good at light PC gaming. I wouldn't expect to play AAA games on this, but for $400, you are going to get good bang for your buck. In terms of emulation, I think that it can comfortably run all the way up through Wii U. Now, you will have to pick and choose what platform to play everything on. For example, Bob 
Nevada Serra is not going to be able to play PS2 and Wii U very well, but the Windows side can handle them just fine. And then when it comes to overall temperature, you know, I never really saw it spike even up to 80 degrees, so I think it has decent thermals and the fan works well. And I think when it comes to everyday PC tasks, things like shopping and browsing and your taxes, all that stuff's just fine. And it works really well with 4K video playback or as a media server. Now, of course, not every device is perfect, and there are quite a few things I don't like about this device either. Number one, the biggest disappointment here is the lack of the SATA hard drive slot. Your only options here are to either just stick with 256 gigs of internal storage, which is completely unreasonable, or you'll have to buy a bigger NVMe drive or use an external hard drive. All of those options to me are unacceptable, especially when there's space for a SATA hard drive. I also think that they cut corners when it came to the RAM. I think eight gigs is just not enough, especially when you have a pretty good CPU here and Ryzen is known for being reliant on fast and good RAM. And so if you do plan on buying this device, I would factor in the fact that you're gonna wanna upgrade to 16 gigs instead. Additionally, I wish there was a way to adjust the TDP in the BIOS and I'm not like a computer hacking wizard. And so maybe there's some option in there that I didn't find, but I went through the whole thing and could and find it. And I think if you were able to adjust the TDP in the BIOS, you'd be able to use it on the Linux side. Thankfully, there's a Windows app to be able to adjust it on the fly, but I wish you could have it just overall across the board. And finally, it's an annoyance, but I don't like the fact that that little fan is off center. It kind of annoys me. You know, for being such a great design, this is the one thing that kind of undermines itself. And I'm sure it just came down to the part that they had available and they just weren't able to line it up right. But if that was the case, then I wish it wasn't so prominently visible. So yeah, even though there are quite a few things I don't like about this device, there are definitely more things I like about it than what I don't like. And it's hard to overstate just how nice and clean the overall design is here. I like the contrasting black and white design. It's a little bit bold, but they kept it nice and clean too. And so at the end of the day, do I recommend buying the Chewy Larkbox X? And of course, that's going to depend on you, but I do think there are a couple of use cases where this is going to be a viable product. I think that if you or maybe one of your loved ones is in the market for a nice looking and small PC to set on your desk, then this is a nice looking option that does have some good computing power. And having the ability to do some light PC gaming and emulation are a great bonus. As we saw, this can emulate all the way up to Wii U with relatively minor issues. And then if you were to set it up with a Bodicera flash drive on the side, that would allow you to store all the games on the flash drive so that you're not taking up that precious internal space. So overall for $400, Yes, this is a nice PC, but I think to get the most out of it, you are going to want to upgrade the RAM and you are going to have some storage limitations as well. And I think if you're at that point where you're having to buy parts to make this thing more viable, then potentially your better bet is to look at the other mini PCs at the $500 range instead. Because at that point, some of the alternatives from companies like B-Link or Minis Forum might give you more bang for that buck. Either way, let me know what you think in the comments below. This is actually up and available on Amazon right now, and I'll leave links in the video description in case you want to check it out. And as always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.